those words become real for young people, they become flesh, then in fact they are not their words. They're somebody else's words, somewhere else floating around, hoping to find a place called home. And she said, the reason why I'm mad is because you all aren't doing your job. You all aren't telling not only teenagers, but anybody in your congregation about what God said about sexuality. It's so easy, especially on the kid that you've really worked with, because if that kid messes up, it's a reflection on me and my ministry. What I've been doing, how dare you sin? Ruin my track record. Don't interrupt. Don't prepare what you will say while your child is speaking, while your youth is talking. Just listen, 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 listen. You are not in ministry to be right. You are in ministry so they will be like Jesus. We're pleased that you're here, and this is going to be a small conference, but we think it's going to be an excellent conference. It's smaller than the number of participants, but the, number, the presenters are some of the most, just the most wonderful people and the most skillful people that you're going to ever get an opportunity to hear. And it's kind of a unique conference, too. I was talking to, to Michael Peace as we were coming in. We were saying, you're here, here. And this is going to be a small conference. But we think it's going to be an excellent conference. It's smaller than the number of participants. But the, the, the presenters are some of the, just the most wonderful people and the most skillful people that you're going to ever get an opportunity to hear. And it's kind of a unique conference, too. I was talking to, to Michael Peace as we were coming in. We were saying, we don't know of another conference anywhere that is specifically devoted to working with inner city young people. We just don't know of one. And we're really committed to this conference being a wonderful conference and to having it build from year to year until it's a truly big and national conference. So I'm glad that you're here to be a part of the first one. And the bottom line is when there's something happening at the pool, folks are going to gather. And people may disagree about what's happening, but everybody's got to admit there must be something happening at the pool. And one of the problems you have with explaining yourself and explaining your ministry and explaining your strategy and explaining your philosophy is that there are people who are questioning whether or not kids can come off the street and be in love with Jesus. There are people who are questioning whether or not people who are poor can fall in love with Jesus. There are people who question whether or not God really has enough power to change people who snatch gold chains off people's necks. And the bottom line is, rather than argue over whether or not it can happen, you just keep stirring up the waters, and as long as people gather at the pool, God will do the rest. Amen. But when there's something happening at the pool, you can be a volunteer and not know what to do with the children. The reason... Your budget is too small to meet the needs of your kids because there's something happening at the pool. That's right. And people will gather. I've never had a problem getting kids. My problem has been to get volunteers and get money and facilities and transportation as reliable. <laughs>
Because until that happens, you're just you're dealing with children who have sense enough to trick you into thinking that they're all right. And urban youth ministry chooses to have problems. And in so doing, steps out into that territory that Jesus talked about when he said, sick folk need a doctor, not well folks. Right. There was a multitude of people there. But John records that Jesus focused in on one. And one of the problems we have in ministry is that we've, been, we've fallen into this trap of having what we call a bifurcation dividing social from spiritual. Can you imagine the lunatic that started that debate? Which means then that our ministry are both spiritual and social. They are both justice and righteousness. We are both evangelists and advocates. <coughs> and the time is right. It's better now than it's ever been before. If you want to have a youth ministry that's indigenous, that's contextually relevant in community, and we're lacking, we, you know why we need a lot of outside resources? Not to exclude outside resources, because we don't know how to reach youth in our community and train them as leadership so they can be there for the duration of time. They don't have vacations, remember. They don't go away for two weeks, and they don't go visit their mom in, in, in West Virginia. They're in North Philly forever. <laughs> Indigenous leadership. You got to reach them early. I believe that's the way it takes 15 years. Are you willing to settle down and say, I'm committed to youth ministry at a local church or Kingdom Works or wherever you're at uh, for the duration of time, for that period of time? That's what it's going to cost. Receive from the knowledge and wisdom. I think there's got to be a point in your life where you're beginning to recognize how much youth have to offer you. They are a gift. Even when they're the, the biggest and heaviest thorn in your side. <laughs> I mean, even when you feel like you wish there were no use in the world. <laughs> because of this one character. Receive from them knowledge and wisdom. I know we have a hard time in understanding what could, wisdom can I get from you, but I believe that you will receive knowledge and wisdom from you. <laughs> it was reciprocal ministry. I feel this way about it, and I've said it before in the covenant section, it's just that you've got to nearly remember that, I don't know, they, there's just an, if they're free, using telepods approaches, they're unleashed that they feel that all of a sudden Manny has given me some certain amount of respect, that I have a freedom. And he's learning from me, and I'm learning from him, there's reciprocity. And then you begin to do ministry, and he or she is free to do ministry with you. The kind of leader role really changes. It becomes very much alongside of it's a kind of Holy Spirit approach where they're your comforter, your encourager, or you're theirs. And you work together. And I think that's crucial. Something has to break down. Even though you're young, you still may have this kind of adult bias that says that young people really have a lot yet to learn. All you got to do is look at yourself in the morning in the mirror and say, Oh, my thing. <laughs> you will find out that you've got to do ministry with you. One of the things in contextualizing the gospel, or making the gospel really something tangible in the community in which we're living in, in which you're working with, is that uh, sometimes ministry has uh, used clothing, but is not really used thoroughly. It's not used through and through. I think this is where young life has at least something of an edge, and very important, is that they are used through and through. Uh, it's not just clothing with an adult mentality. It has really a youth understanding through and through. So they're able to contextualize the gospel, to give it relevance in community, help kids to really digest it. And there's an interesting thing about it. When you move in like Paul did, 
when you go to be with them, when you move in on their turf, there's something about it that humility helps us to be incarnate. And incarnation helps us to be more humble than we ever expected. Because there's less of us. We find out that, God, we can't make it here. We don't even know how to do it. God, I need you. I can't handle this or that. I can't wait till my two years are up. Or I can't. <laughs> Whatever the case is, there's a sense where when you move in, it's because something is beginning to happen in your life. And you begin to learn the language. You've got to. God speaks the language of you. I love that. I love that God understood my needs and he spoke to me in my language to help me to see the gospel of Christ. You've got to be Christ-centered. That's what transforms lives. It's kind of a tiring thing. Kids really want to see a changed person. Give me one changed person sometimes. You see, they can't cut through all the stuff and they don't know what transformation is. Not only that, if you're not living near them, they don't really know except that you sound very angelic when you're there with them. And that doesn't prove anything. It's nearly a long-range thing where they're able to see the journey that this man or woman are going through and be able to say, there is transformation in your life taking place. This is the gospel that they're talking about. Is this one that transformed Jimmy. God wants transformed lives. It's Christ-centered ministry. I think the important part here is key to youth uh, ministry for me is vulnerability, is weakness, honest ministry. It's honest ministry. And I know that that's the problem. If I am vulnerable and honest at this moment, I think they will run over me. I've got to keep my guard. And they've got to know that I've been at the gym all week. And I'm going to grab him if he moves. <laughs> Something has to happen that we're really honest. And we do come. And I think this is what Paul is saying. I came to you in weakness and fear. That's the beginning of youth ministry is weakness. Not strength, it's weakness, it's vulnerability. And one of the things that I discovered is that we can be absolute geniuses at programming and in developing skills and lose sight of the fact that what's hanging in the balance are the lives of people. A colleague of mine at Drew University once said, I actually became a more effective professor when I stopped teaching material and started teaching people. I assume that most people, especially young adults who do youth ministry at a certain point, will go and do something else. And the question then is, how will the young people make it without you? Because the easiest thing in the world, especially for those of us in our 20s, those of you in your 20s, and when I was in my 20s, the easiest thing in the world is to run a program, is to reach young people in such a way that they ultimately become dependent upon you for their spiritual growth. We, are, in our 20s, we are still developing our own relationships. We are still developing our own uh, adulthood. We are still developing our own sense of what it means to be present in the world. And we get close to these kids, and these kids make us feel good. We like them. They, they look up to us. And we, it's very easy, especially in your young adulthood, it is very easy to get kids into a place where they become spiritually dependent upon you. And that's not just an indictment at young people. Older adults have the same thing. My kids aren't working out at home, so I'm going to do youth ministry in the church. Since I can't take care of my teenagers, then I'll take care of somebody else's teenagers and develop the same kind of dependency. And even for those of us who are parents and things are working out at home, sometimes we can create a dependency in the part of our children on us so that even when they're 30 and 40 years old, they still haven't learned how to stand on their own two feet. And so part of what I assume about the discipleship process is that we're fostering not only independence, but the ability for the young people that we leave behind to take care of each other, to disciple each other, to set up peer groups, which is something we'll talk about in the, in the seminar in particular. What do you see when you see that boy, when you see that girl, when you see that teenager, that Hispanic person, that, that poor white child who lives in the city? What do you see? Do you see their inconsistencies? Do you look at their grades and assume that because their, their grades are low that they are intellectually limited? In the city of New York, where I currently work, they track students in the public school system. You know what tracking is? Tracking means they give you an intelligence test. Okay, whatever that is. 
intelligence test. And then what they do is, depending on your intelligence test score, they put you in a class with people who are like you. So you've got the gifted class, and then you've got the normal class, and then you've got the developmental class. Well, they did an experiment in one of the small districts in the city of New York. They told the teacher who had the gifted students that she had the developmental class. They told the teacher that had the developmental class that she had gifted students. And you can guess what the results are. In fact, if they weren't the way they were, I couldn't use that as an illustration, could I? You know. <laughs> the results of the study were that the developmentally disadvantaged class tested out like gifted students, and the gifted students tested out like the developmentally disadvantaged students. Why? Because they were being taught according to the image that the teacher had. If your image is limited, then the young people with whom you work will develop into that limited image. Because fundamental to youth ministry in the inner city is the enabling of young men and young women to develop healthy relationships. There is something in us that cries out for relationships. When Jesus called the 12, I don't know how to, how, let's get back to the intimacy. When Jesus called the 12, he called them to be together because he understood that this Christian walk was not meant to be done by ourselves. And if you create a bunch of little individual Christians who run off and be their little individualistic self, they will burn out and die on the vine. They need each other. They need accountability. They need love for each other. They need to work together. They need to pray together. They, they need to develop a sense of caring for each other. Because if the people of God do not provide those kind of relationships, the people of darkness will. I mean, do, do you have good, solid, adult relationships? A youth leader who does not have good, solid, adult relationships will tend to invest his or her energies in relating to the kids, and the kids will become your best friends, and you'll be an adolescent for the next 10 years. And the danger is, unless you expose your kids to Moses and Elijah, how big the kingdom is, that their own spiritual journey will be similarly narrow. That the only Christians are in your little youth group. That missions means putting a dollar in the plate once a week. And not what God is doing in Africa and in Asia and in the Soviet Union or what's left of it. What, how big is the kingdom? What is their purpose? How do they fit into this grand scheme of things? The Mount of Transfiguration experience has everything to do with all of those questions. This thing is bigger than Nazareth. This thing is bigger than Galilee. It goes all the way back to the beginning of human history. It is transcendent. It is marvelous. It is Moses. It is Elijah. It is Jerusalem. It's not just your youth group. It's not just sitting around sharing Bible stories. This is an eternal movement. It's bigger than anything you can imagine. That's what the Mount of Transfiguration is all about. And that's what kids have to be able to see. How big this thing is. What is God doing in Haiti? What is God doing in the Dominican Republic? We have to get beyond this notion, especially with inner city kids, that the problems that inner city kids are dealing with are so big that we've got to concentrate on dealing with them where they are and not expose them to anything else. We live in a society that is going to pay kids according to roles and certain expectations instead of dealing with them as individuals. 40 kids in the classroom, Divide them up, they're a number. They have to learn to be individuals and not just be roles, especially the boys. And you can go get the ACLU, whatever. But inner city boys, especially African American boys, are playing roles when they should be being individuals. They have been taught that there are certain ways to act, certain roles to play, certain ways to fit in the pecking order. And somebody needs to meet them as individuals. Joyce Ladner, Hunter College, did a study of the Pruitt Igo housing projects in St. Louis, Missouri, and discovered that for teenage girls in that project, having a baby 
served the same function as a debutante ball did for the girls in suburban Chesterfield. Having a baby and entering into the mothering role was the way in which they achieved adulthood. Somebody's got to get in there and not tell them don't do it, but how to be a person. They'll slip, they'll stumble, they'll fall, but ultimately, it's God who's doing the work. Matthew Johnson has not said that what he did was wrong. What he was saying was, I didn't do everything right. If I had just used a condom, I wouldn't have been in this position in the first place. <coughs> what kind of message do you think we're putting out to young people? We're putting out a message of hopelessness. I was at an outreach of all places, working with gangs in Omaha, Nebraska, not very long ago. I'm out there and I'm speaking out against safe sex. And one kid, a kid stands up, 14 to 15 years old, stands up and pulls out in an outreach. I'm outdoors. Pulls out a condom out of his pocket and says, got my condom right here. And everybody in the crowd were clapping. Yeah, he got his condom. You know how the talk goes. You know how the affections go. Right, right? Yeah, he got his condom over there. I said, oh, you all agree with him, right? And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking at me like I was crazy. And then I say, so you, you, you use a condom, sir. And I said, all of you who believe in this, you use a condom because you want to prevent from getting AIDS, right? Yup, yup, everybody, yup, he's right, he's right. So you want to use your condom so you don't end up getting pregnant, right? Yup, yup, everybody's clapping, yeah, right? And I says, that's very interesting. I said, sir, what happens when your condom breaks? I said, it's a fact that condoms break, sir. The whole place got quiet. And I said, does anybody else want to say something stupid? <laughs> you see, we're living in a society of hopelessness. It is a culture of hopelessness. And you see, as long as there is hopelessness being brought forth in our society, we, rec we have to recognize our responsibility to bring hope. And the only hope that, that they need is the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? We have very famous people bringing forth to our kids all kinds of quote, quote, values and morals, but they're only bringing those things forth because that's what's going on in their own lives. These adults are living like this, therefore it reflects in their music, in their books, uh, in the movies they're in, in the television programs they're on. It's all, whatever in their hearts comes out. We know the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Very simple concept for us to all understand. We better, we better accept it. It's the word of God, amen? But just the same, uh, it says here, keep the heart with our diligence for out of it are the issues of life. And in and, and and NIV it says, guard thy heart with our diligence. Out of it are the issues of life. One song says, Don't believe the hype. And that's exactly what they did with the song. They hyped up urban kids. They hyped up, well, they basically they hyped up black kids. They hyped them up. Did not give them any substance at all. No substance at all. All they did was, Don't believe the hype. Wear African pennants around your neck. Now we have Afrocentric thought. And didn't teach them a thing. And still aren't teaching them a thing. All of these songs out here aren't teaching them a thing. You listen to the song when the song is done. Songs like In the Ghetto. I wrote a song in 1987, and it, I released it in 1987, In the Ghetto, right? Well, since then, um, not because of me, because I'm sure all these rappers don't listen to my music, but since then there are two other rappers that have written a song called In the Ghetto, right? You listen to the song, everybody says, oh, this is a real positive song, a real positive song. Oh, really? What's so positive about it? All they did was talk about the problem that exists in the ghetto. When the song was done, what was the answer or the solution? There was none. You know why? We have a culture of hopelessness. But anybody that talks about the problem is called positive in our society. Except those who really bring forth an answer or the solution. Then we're called lunatics. We're called fanatics. Hallelujah. It's amazing. It's amazing. And this is what goes on. And, and we accept this in the body of Christ. We accept these things also. We certainly do. What about integrity? And in a word, or in a, in a description, this is what I perceive, personally, I perceive integrity to be. Not doing something in private that you wouldn't want to be caught, found doing in public. Did you catch that? Don't do it in private if you wouldn't want to be busted 
for doing so in, prom- in public. How do you, what do you think about your kids? You have a problem with your kids using profanity, but you go to a movie to hear it. You know you're gonna, you know you're gonna hear it in the, in the theater. If we don't do things with the, with the intensity of what God wants us to do, what do you expect our young people to do in our culture today? What you do, or what we do in moderation, our kids will do in excess. Did you catch that? What you and I, what we do in moderation, our kids will do in excess. Like when a kid walks in and sits in your car, and turns on the radio, and finds that you listen to the same station that he or she listens to, and you notice that they listen to is not right. That's right. That's right. If you don't like, if you don't like your kids using profanity, then you shouldn't be listening to stations that play the music of people that, that, that use profanity. Yeah. Because they're looking at you. Because they figure, well, yo, he's listening to, 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 you know, to Kiss 100. So then obviously he approves of what's going on, or she approves of what's going on. So I'll go buy the record from the same person that he's listening to on the radio. Are you catching this? What you do in moderation, they would do in excess. You've never seen a kid underdo anything except when it comes to living for God, unfortunately. Right? Right? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, follow me as I follow the example of Christ. If you can't teach, if you are teaching these kids a principle that's in the word of God in a practical way, they want to see how it can be done practically by watching your lifestyle. That's what they're looking for. We have people out there that are poisoning our kids' minds. And some of us are agreeing with our kids. Look, I understand. I know what it's like to live on welfare. I do. I know what it's like to live in the projects. I do. I know what it's like to be arrested at 14. I do. Please believe me. I do. I know what it's like to have part of, live part of your life without a father in the household. I know what it's like to grow up a foster child. My mother died when I was three and a half. And I've been living in foster home. I lived in foster homes my entire life. I understand all of that. But you see, the problem is, we keep looking at the problem, and if we don't offer a solution through Jesus Christ, you are wasting your kids' time, and deeper than that, you're wasting God's time. We live in a culture of hopelessness, and God is expecting you to raise a standard. Let me give you some ways to deal with, to, 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 to affect your kids, with music. Um, and you can write these down, you know. And, and I'm saying this on video, so it'll be on record, because I, like, I don't mind if these companies know. Right? For every musical art form that there is, in a secular sense, there is a Christian, at least one Christian, that's doing it better than a secular artist. So what I do, I enfranchise my kids. I teach my kids how to have business cards. I teach my kids how to articulate so clearly and so professionally that they're making, you know, sure, they're not making, you know, $300 a day. But my kids are having pride now that they're making $40 a day breaking people's leaves. That's right. I, have fr- I teach my kids. I'll go, I'll go to, the, to, the, to the hardware store and I say, um, Sir, would you be willing to invest in the lives of 10 teenagers to get free rakes, garbage bags, and, 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 and brooms? And I says, You know what? If you could do it and give it away now, it'd be a tax deduction. Or maybe one of these kids end up robbing your store. And they up in jail, and it'd be a tax induction. <laughs> I enfranchise my kids. I appeal to their sense of reasoning. I would rather rake leaves now than be making license plates later. Yo, but I got my chance to get my piece of the pie. Yeah, you got your piece of the pie. Now it's all eaten up. Now what you gonna do? Now what are you gonna do? You're in the slams. You tell your boys to let them laugh at you now. You come visit them later. Or you'll send them a wreath. You ask them what is his favorite flower. So when you go to his funeral, you can lay it on his coffin. Go tell him now then. That's how I deal with my kids. And a friend of mine said a couple of weeks ago, he said, what are we going to do about this situation? He said, the addict goes into a program, a Christ in a program, but does not learn any tools to use. And so they come out and they become a burden on the church. And the church is not ready, see, because the church has not educated itself. The average congregation is scared to death of addiction, 
And so they don't, the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. They're scared too. And so what happens is they um, turn their back on the addict. The addict is searching and looking for support and encouragement. Just come out of a program six or eight months, genuinely serious about recovery. Nobody knows how to say use your tools. Nobody says go to Sunday school and walk them through. We call it walking through. One of the things you will hear is, is a lot of language that we have developed over the last four years in the ministry and very practical stuff. But uh, we call it walking them through. Somebody who says, I will pick you up and take you to prayer meeting every morning. I will see that you get to Bible class. I will see that you're in Sunday morning service. And so what happens is the lifestyle changes pla people, places, and things. And so because the lifestyle changes, the, the people, places, and things have to change. And so it's a whole new agenda and the addict has to learn how to live as a Christian. So most of the time you find there's nobody who will walk that person through. And so when that person comes to their bottom, there needs to be somebody who's going to lead them on the road to rehabilitation. And as they begin to come back up, you see all the processes that that person goes through in uh, rehabilitation. If we can pull one kid out, if we can save one kid, we will have accomplished a great mission because that kid could be the kid who gets a vision and becomes a Billy Graham and travel around the world. And so it's very important for us not to minimize our youth groups. It's not but two here tonight. It's not but three here tonight. Don't minimize that. Be very, very in tune with those kids who keep coming, the ones who keep coming back, coming back, coming back. And, and make a special effort to be involved with them. Always trying to do three things. We're always trying to do three things in this world. When working with young people, we need to always be thinking about at least three parts. That is when you are developing your sermons, your presentations, your lay messages, whatever it is you're trying to develop, try to think of these three parts. The first part is we want our young people to think of staying with God, stay in God, stay there, start there, start there, start with God. You have some trouble, start with God. Get in, you, you're angry, start with God. Can't get somebody to do what you want, start with God. Can't pass that, start with God. We, we always want our young people to get grounded real fast, go back, run back to the rock, start with God. What are the deep, almost hushed questions they are asking? Yeah, or you know, something to do with what's going to happen to me, that kind of thing. They're always asking that. You say, well, wait a minute, this is about the Bible. Well, that's about the Bible also. It's about human nature. That's what that's about. Uh, what about idealism, realism, and sexuality? It, it, it's something that young people love to talk about. You can hook them with that. You can get them into a group. You can talk about that and move out into anything else. But you've got to start with where they are. And very often with young people, we don't start with where they are, Diane. We just kind of jump over there, you know. I'm glad your name tag was some, some name tag. <laughs> That's what you get for having to know you. But uh, we uh, try to get past that. Whenever you want somebody to learn something, start with where they are. So it start with the known and move to the unknown. Some people say, no, I think you ought to start with the unknown and then excite them and then move to the known. No, 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 no. I'm thinking, and I don't want to say it's absolutely right because maybe both models work. But for the most part, it's always good to start where a person is. I work for the Mayor's Commission on Literacy in Philadelphia. This is a brochure, and before you go, maybe you'll get one. We always have lots of volunteer tutors, and we're always looking for more. And, we have, and it's a lot of going on with connecting. Talking about reading, you can't read anything unless you start where the person is. You have to start where the person is. How does all this relate to storytelling? Well, let's turn over and see. These are some of the questions that young people are asking. What does this have to do with scripture? What can you do on a date? What do you think about that? What can you do on a date? I think that we need to be about giving our young people some ideas. Did anyone ever give you an idea what to do on a date? Tell the truth now. They never told you. What do you see yourself doing in five years? 
visualize. There are young people that never get a chance to shut their eyes and visualize anything. And storytelling, just to create the ambience, the environment, the thoughts, the imagination, think about it. Jesus feeding the masses. Just to see what you see. What picture do you see? What about the valley of the dry bones? Oh, the valley of the bones. Did anybody ever draw a picture of the valley of the bones? Young people like that kind of drama. There's so many different messages coming at them. Do this, don't do that. Go here, go there. And even sometimes well-meaning friends will come alongside of them and give them conflicting messages. You know, one person will say, well, you know, if it was me, I'd do this. Well, if it was me, I'd do that. You know, when I was in your situation, I went over here. You know, the conflicting messages to the point where I've seen it on occasion where we've done, we've done the same thing with kids when they just come and stand still in the middle of the room, not knowing where to go. On one occasion, we did the same thing. We had a whole group of people in the room. We had a young man do it, and they were telling him, go right, go left. And you know how kids get carried away with stuff? He walked right into the wall. And, and every, after everybody fell out with laughter and then they recovered, it illustrated a good point. Because he was listening to so many different things and so many different messages that he literally walked into a brick wall. And that's what happens with kids and teenagers sometimes, particularly about this particular issue. You're meeting young ladies and young men in crisis pregnancy situations. Don't, sometimes we forget to deal with the young men, too. While they're going through this, walk through it with them. Make sure that they get, if they're going to carry the term, and most of the young ladies do, walk, make sure they go to the doctor for their prenatal visits. If they're not sure of being pregnant, go to the center with them and, and while they go through the test. Man, that's a traumatic experience, no matter what the place is. I've gone and sat with girls while they went through and had the test. I don't go in the room with them, but I, I've been there for their support. Walk alongside the process with them. Whether the test is positive or negative, be with them after the thing is over with. And then if, once they find out the news, if they're carrying the baby to term, then, then walk alongside them and provide for the material needs. Because they may come from a poor or disadvantaged background, or they may come from a situation where their parents are like, hey, I don't want this, get out of here, and throw them out. We've had that too. And be prepared to minister to them in the way that I know you all know how to do. Because that's why you're here, you're concerned. We've been the advocates in our city to teach chastity in the schools. Um, most of our high schools around the area are under contract with Planned Parenthood, and they come in and they teach teenage sexuality with the students in the school system and show them how to use condoms and all that kind of stuff. Cool, that's their thing. But what we ask also, too, is to give us some time, and we've done that in one school already, and we sat on a panel in another school where I coach wrestling at, and we asked to come in there and teach chastity and teach what it means. I mean, not no f any flowery things, but teach it so that it can be practical as much as we can teach it in one classroom setting. I mean, other people have six, seven weeks to do their thing. We generally get one session. One of the things that we found lacking, one of the things we emphasize in this center is that a lot of the counselors don't even know how to lead someone to Christ, and we even provide that, you know, basic step by step. And then after that, there's always ongoing stuff. Most men in our society are taught to do rather than to be, to be valued for what they do and not for who they are. They are taught that they are important based on what they accomplish and what they achieve. Now, the gospel says you're important because you're created in the image of God. That's it, plainly and simply. Support versus condemnation and accountability versus pollution. Jesus says in John chapter 20 that the disciples have the authority to forgive sins. James says in James chapter 5 
that we are to confess our sins one to another that we might be healed. What are they getting at? They're getting at the fact that the evil that is within us, the struggles that are within us, are to be part of the community and that we need a forum within the context of which young people can begin to deal with their struggles, their sin. They need to process their sin. They need to experience God's forgiveness. And my experience is that for most young adults and for most teenagers, the sin problem is dealt with in one of two ways, either by condemnation or collusion. All of Jesus' ministry was in groups. That explains it, doesn't it? He had Peter, John, and James. They went with him. They went special places, Transfiguration, Gethsemane, little girl's house when Jesus said, Talita Kumai. She was raised from the dead. Peter, John, James. Inner circle. The twelve. Apostles. The 70 to be sent out in twos. Who are your three? No. They're the three kids that God has given to you to work with, like Jesus worked with Peter, John, and James. Three kids that are closer to you than anybody else. But that's not fair. I don't know from fair. Jesus spent more time with Peter than Bartholomew. He did. It's a fact. If that's not fair, Jesus wasn't fair. He spent more time with James than he did Nathaniel. He spent more time with James than he did Andrew, and James got killed in a few months. That's heavy. That means that the one that you bury yourself in may not turn out the way you expect him to, but spend the time anyway. Because the issue is not how successful you've been through the exalted career of the kids you work with, but whether or not you're faithful to that kid at that moment. Encourage the use of prayer partners among young people. Teach them to pray for each other. Give them a sense that they are in their prayer life accountable for their friends. All kinds of stuff you can do with this. I mean, everything from passing hats and putting names in the hat. It's funny, you end up, um, after a while, kids start praying for each other anyway. They don't need the hat anymore. So the first thing we see is that the unconcern for the needs of teenagers. You know, this country or this society as it is right now really does not like children and young people. It doesn't. Although this society is youth oriented, it has a negative thing about being young. So there's a great gulf between youth and the older population, which is bad because nothing is transmitted. They're in an adversary relationship. The first thing is to discover your vision. That's the first thing you have to do before you can talk about a vision. You have to find, well, what is my vision? Youth ministry is not an inferior ministry. Of any ministry in youth ministry, you have to have a ministry. You have to have a system. You have to have plans. We tend to run off and just do things. But we have no context, no big picture, no ultimate goal. So you have to have a vision. And one of the easiest way to arrive at what your vision might be for youth ministry is to write a mission statement. Just about two sentences. Write a mission statement. What is my purpose? What is my objective? I know at our church, our mission statement for the youth department is not only to win them to Christ and to disciple them, but to empower them. And what that means is, the people I'm dealing with have no power socially, economically, politically, financially, nothing. They don't have no power. So it's a whole big package, not just to win them to Christ, not just to disciple them, but to empower them. 
Now, within that context, I know exactly what I'd like to end up with. I'd like to end up, I'd like to end up with young people that have high, high earning power because they have the ability to do it. I like to end up with young people who have a concern for their own generation, that they want to impact their own generation for Christ. So this is what's happening to our youth. So in other words, what happens is they rise to the expectation. You're expected to go to jail, so you go to jail. You go to j you, if you go to jail, it's no big deal because that's what's expected of you. And that's what happens in the schools. The teachers don't expect a whole lot of them either. So they don't achieve. But see, in, in our youth group, I tell them, I expect a lot of you. You're valid. I affirm who you are. I affirm your blackness. But you're going to produce. You're going to be something. And I help them do that. And that's what it's about. minority kids in particular, there was never a sense of home, of roots in this country. So when you were dealing with minority children, minority girls even, you're dealing with a sense of homelessness and rootlessness and powerlessness. So where your clubhouses are, where your groups are meeting, you must form in some way a sense of homeness. I like the idea when you're saying that you have meetings in your house. I think that's a really good idea. Therefore, I'm challenging some people to live in the communities you're working in. It is a very powerful witness to live Because if, it is, if you are there for that time and then you are gone, there's no form of modeling connectedness to the community that you say working with the kids. The point of this is they will never get understanding of homeless if the model that they're following always leaves the community they live in every day. You understand that? So you can't model community and homeness if it's very easy for you to be mobile and move out or leave. Their image will be, I want to be to and follow the model. How do we develop a place that, that there is a sense of belonging that it is safe, that it is a place of love. Well, the first, I think, is that we need to begin by establishing consistent workers. I think that that is key to any church program, but especially an after-school program that works with smaller kids. I think it's crucial that we tap into people who are committed for a period of time. And uh, as many Ortiz uh, talked about this morning, about the need for youth workers to sort of not see youth work as just a stepping stone, but as a, as a vocation. And as taking children through, you know, kindergarten, grade school, uh, teenage years, to, to make that 15-year commitment. And I don't, you know, I don't know what your commitments are, but the whole idea of consistency is so crucial if we want to develop a, a type of program that is like a family, where the program is meeting some of those basic family needs that our children need. So the first is, is consistency, and I just want to say also that, you know, I, I've been there, and I, I've been a fairly consistent person, and, and I've also used a lot of volunteers, and I think there is a very, um, a very strong need for volunteers and a, and a very significant place for volunteers in an after-school program. Um, I need volunteers to come in and kind of, you know, with fresh energy and vigor, you know, and and give the children the energy and, and, and the attention that they need. And that's great, and volunteers come and go, and I think there is a place for that. But I also think there's a place and a real need for at least one or two people in your program to be consistent. You know, Bruce is always there, or Robert is just there, you know, and I know that when I go, 
even though some of the faces may be new, Bruce will be there, or Robert will be there. And I think that that's crucial and key. So consistency, and yet I th still think there's a, there's a very important place for volunteers and temporary workers. Um, the next is just sort of developing a sense of history with your children and with your group. The emphasis is on placement. Will they get a job when they graduate? It doesn't matter if they're successful, if they choose and they go on to college, or if they choose the armed forces, or if they make a good decision like, like that for themselves for the future. It matters, did they get a job, and did they keep it for 30 days? And if they kept it for 30 days, we'll give you the rest of your grant money, but if they didn't, that doesn't count. And, you know, many times I, you know, I've had arguments that Mother Teresa, who works in Calcutta, she, she made the statement once, they told her she was wrong in what she was doing because uh, she was giving people fish when she should teach them to fish and they could feed themselves for a lifetime. You know, you've heard that expression. If you teach a man to fish, if you give a man a fish he can eat for a day, if you can teach him to fish, he can uh, eat for a lifetime. And she said, my job is to give them the fish so they can eat for the day. Then when they're strong enough, I'll turn them over to you and you teach them how to fish and make them get on with the rest of their life. Well, you know, I struggle back and forth with that. It's my job to teach them how to fish or to help them. Well, many times they come and these are kids in school and they're a little better than, than, let's say, like a person who may be really down and out. But yet, can we really say that? Who can make that judgment unless we're in the person's place? They have to come in and prove, first of all, that they're economically disadvantaged. And who am I to make a judgment past that, that, that they're able to, uh, to fend for themselves because they're in a school or they, they, have, they have a parent at home? Maybe they are a little better off than somebody, but the struggles young people are up against today, who can really say that? So am I supposed to teach them how to fish or to fish? Well, I think I do both. And I think what the government's saying, they don't really care whether or not uh, uh, anything else has been good, done good with them. They don't care if they may have been a kid who was going to drop out of school and you, you kept them in and they graduated and got a diploma. No, did they get a job? Well, a job might be another couple steps down the line. They might not be ready for the job yet. But uh, that's, all, that's all that the emphasis is on. And then we have federal funding through the Job Training Partnership Act through our local private industry council. That's our source of funding, the private industry council. They exist uh, nationwide, or they're, they're supposed to exist nationwide for, for that particular purpose. Now understand this. Winston is telling us that these are the people that should be leading the community. Understand that. I'm not making a case for the uneducated to lead the community. Winston is saying the people that have gotten us where we are are the uneducated because the educated haven't done what they were supposed to do in the first place. That's the case. And that one just is, is another popular one which says, my people are destroyed because of the lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as priests. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I will also ignore your children. Understand that this, the context of Hosea is speaking to Israel. <coughs> And they had rejected the knowledge that God had given them in the scriptures, in his presence in their daily lives. And when I use this scripture educationally, I want kids to understand that, that when, when, when we do not pursue knowledge, it is a simple way of destroying yourself. Because, you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's an entire being that we're trying to create here. And to have, you know, NAACP says it well, actually the Nightingale College Fund. A mind is a terrible what? Thing to, waste. thing to waste. A mind's a terrible thing to waste. And so if you waste your mind, then, then, then my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. So they have to, the thing is, is like, there's Jesus and there's some of the disciples out there and they're having a great time. And I mean, it must, I mean, you can't get any higher than that. And you know what happened after the transfiguration? They had to come down. And it, and it, it is not just figurative language that they had to come down. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they, they came down the mountain, but they came down more than a mountain. I mean, it's not just describing the geography. It's describing... The, the situation. So I thought it might be good for us on Sunday morning as we have to get ready to go home to talk about coming down. Because we got to come down. Interesting thing. After it was all over with. So suddenly when they looked around, 
They no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. See, that's a good way to start coming down from the mountaintop, is to, is to acknowledge one thing. That there will come a time when you will, be, you will get back and you will see no one around you. But if your eyes are good, you will see that there is no one around you except Jesus. I mean, you know, it's fun to be together. And it's fun to have staffs and work together. But there come times in ministry and there come times in life when there is no one around you except Jesus. That's a good place to start. Is, is, is let's, not, let's not make them, you know, oh, we're going to go down. Let's not get too hopeless about going down. Because you do have to go down. You have to leave behind Moses. Leave behind Elijah. Even leave behind the bright light. But you do not have to leave behind Jesus. That is the promise of Jesus for the disciples. That was their reality. That was the promise of Jesus for us when he gave us the Holy Spirit. So Jesus comes down from the mountaintop. And the first thing he runs into is a youth ministry problem. Right? It's a boy. Right? He comes down from the mountaintop and he gets back to him and he's like, Oh no. What happened this weekend while I was away? You're going to have that. You're going to go back and you're going to say, Oh no, what happened? You know, And they're going to come to you with problems. And things that happen, that, and that's what happens. You come up and you get all these wonderful concepts, and you get back, and the phone rings before you even get in the door. The phone's ringing, and you pick it up, right? The van broke down. What you gonna do about it? Tommy's in jail. See, the guy comes to Jesus and he says, "I brought you my son." And you know what? I bet Jesus' response is, "You didn't bring him. I was up on the mountain." See, sometimes we think that we're bringing kids to Jesus, when in fact we're bringing them to disciples, or even just other Christians. When you get close to defeating evil, when you bring evil into your midst, when they bring evil before Jesus, evil goes off. Now, I, I just want you to understand that so that you don't get discouraged when evil goes off. You think, oh, if the kids come into our youth group and if they sit real good, then we've got things going. No, then they're passive. Then they're dead. Then, you know, and I'm telling you something. Love and hate are not opposites. Love and hate are real close together. You know what the opposite of love is? Indifference, apathy. So when they come and they're screaming, ah, I hate this man, shut up, then you know they're close. <laughs> right? Oh, now I got you now. <laughs> oh, man, you just slapped me in the face. Oh, God, we're working. Praise the Lord. Hate me again. When, when evil goes off, you're on your road. When they sit there and say, yeah, oh, I, yes, and they mouth the biblical language to you, oh, you know, and, and, oh, God's my Savior, Jesus, then you know you're dead. And they're dead. So, so rejoice in being exceedingly glad when all this bad stuff happens. If you're honest, you will say along with this man, I do believe. Praise God. Help thou my unbelief. That, that, that's what the reality is in the city. This reality is anywhere. I do believe. Help my unbelief. Here's the thing that this guy was willing to do. Is he was willing. See, he cared. That was the first thing. He cared about his son. He cared about this boy. When youth ministry came along, he cared. And I know that you care. And bless your heart for caring. But the second thing is, beyond his care, he was willing to be honest with Jesus about where he was at in his faith. And some of us are not willing to be honest about where we're at in our faith. When we, when we talk with each other, I, just, I know the Lord's going to take care of it. When we pray for a kid, pray and we pray. And it's a good prayer. We pray. We know the victory has already been won in that kid's life. And we pray that prayer and everybody goes, Amen. Now let me ask you something. Is the victory really won in that kid's life? Or could that kid go down the tubes? Tell me. You know. We talk about things that we want to believe, but that we don't yet believe. And that's all right, as long as we are honest with God. Then Jesus took him by the hand. Good, good, good image. And lifted him up to his feet. And after Jesus lifted him up, he stood up. See, there's two things going on there. Three things, actually. First, he drives out the evil. Then he takes him by the hand, and he gets him up going. And then after a while, he gets to a place where the guy can stand up on his own. It's a good model of youth ministry, I think. 
See, sometimes you've got to take a kid by the hand, but the goal is not to, not to keep him by the hand, but to make him so he can stand. So he can stand up. So he helps him to stand on his own. And then he left him. And you will leave these kids behind at some point. Or they'll leave you. If you get them standing, you know the next thing happens after they start standing up? They'll walk. Many of us are in youth ministry because of strange reasons. But there's only one good reason to be in youth ministry. And that is because we need help with our unbelief. And youth ministry is a place where we can watch God in action. And more important than what it does for the young people is what God wants to do in your life and in my life through our ministry. And in the end, I hope all your kids get healed. But more importantly, I hope you get faith. I hope you get, I, I hope you get belief. I hope you get dependent on God. Because when you get dependent on God, your life can change. And then your kids' lives can change.